Thanks for downloading the In Our Time podcast. For more details about In Our Time and for our terms of use, please go to bbc.co.uk forward slash radio 4. I hope you enjoy the programme. Hello, the Vienna Circle was a group of philosophically trained scientists and scientifically trained philosophers who met on Thursdays in term time in Vienna in the years after the First World War. Out of their meetings there emerged what's been called a revolutionary new doctrine, logical positivism. It rejected great swathes of early philosophy, from meditations on the existence of God to declarations on the nature of history, as utterly meaningless. The logical positivists were trying to remould philosophy in a world turned upside down, not just by war, but by major advances in science. Their hero was Albert Einstein. When the Nazis took power, they fled to England and America, where their ideas put down new roots and went on to have a profound impact. With me to discuss logical positivism are Barry Smith, Professor of Philosophy at the Institute of Philosophy at the University of London, Nancy Cartwright, Professor of Philosophy at the London School of Economics and the University of California, and Thomas Ubel, Professor of Philosophy at Manchester University. Barry Smith, what's the basic idea at the core of of logical uh, positivism? How radical was it? This is very radical. Um, Here we have the Vienna Circle very impressed by science, by developments in logic and mathematics, especially developments in physics, say, but they're also very depressed by the lamentable state of philosophy. You have competing philosophies, metaphysical views about the nature of reality, the ultimate nature of things, and these views are locked into a pointless dispute where you can't see how to make any progress. Now, the positivists in the Vienna Circle think we've got to give philosophy a new job. It has to contribute to the advance of knowledge in the same way science and logic can contribute. So they decide that philosophy doesn't have a doctrine to tell us. It doesn't have a subject matter of its own. Philosophy becomes a method. It's a way of analysing the statements and the, the logical structure of theories. It's a way of deciding which statements are statements of science that are factual, meaningful, can be tested, and contrasting that with statements in logic and mathematics, which are true not because we test them, but because they're true by definition. 2 plus 2 equals 4 follows from the meanings of the words that we use. Now, this new method makes philosophy largely about demarcating meaningful talk, which can be rigorously tested, from the meaningless talk of metaphysics which had pretensions to describe some sublime set of facts, some transcendental reality beyond the ordinary. Now this critique now becomes a critique of language and no longer, as it was with Kant, a critique of pure reason. Well, that's an excellent overview. Can you can we just go back a little bit and tell us some of the people involved? How did they get together? Um, did they discover that they had? What did they? Dis- well, obviously they discovered they had this notion in common. Yes. So um, the the beginning of the movement is really when in 1922 Morris Schlick is appointed to Ernest Mach's chair in Vienna, and he gathers around him a set of scientists and mathematicians and philosophers, very scientifically minded philosophers. And these are people who are ambitious. They want to make progress. They want to see how they can make a genuine contribution to the exciting ideas that are going on around them in physics, in logic and mathematics. They're impressed with Russell and Frege's attempt to reduce mathematics to logic. They're impressed with the new physics of Einstein. And they say, these are people who are telling us something we need to know. So we as philosophers can't be locked in these pointless disputes. So really, the kind of philosophy that had been going on, where you make claims that are untestable, they cannot be decided, we don't know what sort of experiences we would use to tell whether or not one theory was true and another was false, they rejected them as meaningless. Can you pick out one or two more people? You mentioned Schlick. Can you give yes. our listeners uh, uh, an idea of two, two or three other of the key figures we will be returning to in this discussion? Yes, I think the three key figures are Schlick, Carnap, and Neurath. So we can see uh, Schlick as the sort of the leading figure uh, around whom the Vienna Circle gather. Uh, but more more dramatic, I think, is the involvement of Otto Neurath. He's a sociologist. He's a social scientist. And he has a conception, really, of the movement that's taking place as part of a larger social movement. He is interested in the unification of science. He's interested in a community of 
uh, philosophers and scientists working together. In a sense, this is philosophy by committee because you've got a lot of different views, but they're trying to figure out what, what they all think and what they share in common. In between them, you have Rudolf Carnap, perhaps the most influential figure of the movement. He is a, 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 a superbly good logician. He is very inspired by the works of Russell, and he creates a way of rigorously testing scientific theories. So we're in Vienna, and we know what they're coming out of, uh, and we've got a few. We've got the main players there. Nancy Cartwright, can you give us some sense of the scale of what they were rejecting? Yes. <coughs> Excuse me. Barry talked about them wanting to transform philosophy, but that's only a small part of what they wanted to do. I think transforming philosophy was a tool or possibly a side effect because they were interested in transforming society. These people had gone through World War I. Um, Otto Neurath had observed the ability to really regulate the economy and achieve the ends we needed to provide weapons and organize society to get all the munitions and food and clothes to the troops. Um, and he also, they also noticed that there's not just the science of physics that was opening up and coming up with fantastic, fascinating new results, but there was a huge increase in s skills and information in statistics. And they really did believe that with the proper use of scientific knowledge and social scientific knowledge, one could transform society. So they were involved in a, a bigger enterprise than just transforming philosophy. The emphasis on clear thinking, exact formulation, was going to be a tool to rid us of a kind of grand metaphysics that stopped social progress. Uh, they were opposed to religion, um, they were opposed to what they called superstition. Um, their opposition to Hegelian philosophy wasn't just that it was nonsense, which they thought it was, since, as Barry points out, it, you couldn't tie it down to anything. So can you just develop that a little bit about Hegel, just for a few moments? They, they thought it was nonsense. Hegel was nonsense. Right. Why? They thought it was nonsense because you have a grand ideas with very abstract, very loose terms, big claims about the spirit of history marching forward. And when asked, if you try and think about it, um, what do these claims really tell us about real experience in the world around us? They were and the empiricists. dialectical method doesn't, they thought that didn't tell us anything. That doesn't tell you anything. So they were, I think the important thing to start out from is that they were what in Britain we call empiricists. They thought the source of knowledge about the world around us had to be our interactions and our experiences in the world around us, and that our experiences and interactions in the physical world around us were the police for any further claims we made, that, that anything we thought we were talking about that seemed to make sense, but we couldn't tie it back to... We're talking about, as Barry said, some transcendental or sublime views about the world, and that's supposed to be the world we live in. Now, what does... What what support do those grand views have in our real experience and interaction with the world? And they said when there's no support in real experience of the world, you not only can't decide whether what you're saying is true or false, you're not saying anything. You so when you're having religious disputes and metaphysical disputes, uh, back to the word that I got from the notes from through, this is meaningless. Meaningless. It's not just that... Um, it's not just that when you can't test it, you don't know whether it's true or false. It's that you think you're talking about something, and when you get down to it, it there's nothing there. It's uh, vaporous nonsense was the word that the, um, uh, the English uh, positivists used. Although they were very different people and, and a brilliant group of people, um, they, th there was a coherence about them, obviously, these, th these Thursday <laughs> meetings, for one thing, Thursday evenings, not Thursday mornings, I hope. Anyway, um, and uh, they lived in a part of Vienna called Red Vienna, and many were socialists, many were Jews. Did, the, did, that, did the, the, their politics play in very directly to all of them or just some of them? Well, almost all of them were dedicated socialists. Schlick is a bit of a border case. 
but they were dedicated socialists. There was a lot of interaction with uh, other movements in Red Vienna. Uh, there was a close connection between, you know, Carnap wrote uh, uh, a book called the Logische Aufbau, the logical construction of the world. And um, nowadays we talk about Aufbau Bauhaus because the Vienna Circle was closely associated with the Bauhaus movement in architecture. They were interested in Neurath was well, Neurath himself had been the there was a short lived socialist government in Bavaria immediately after World War One and Neurath was the person who was the director of full social planning. So he was going to employ these philosophical ideas, which had already been somewhat developed in an earlier set of meetings before the war, um, to um, organize all of Bavarian economy. So these people were deeply embedded with a, a kind of movement to improve society by clean lines, clear thinking, uh, attention to the details of life, and not getting swept away by religious views that kept you from moving ahead in the right ways. Right. Thomas Herbal, the early 20th century, we, we know about we, major scientific advances. Major scientific advances had happened before. Why was science so important in uh, the approach of this group of people? Well, that is, uh, on the one hand, the sort of biographical reasons, <clears throat> um, as Barry and, and, and Nancy sort of, sort of uh, said. And you said in your introduction, they were... If they were straight philosophers, they actually had scientific training. I mean, Schlick did his PhD with Max Planck, the doyen of, 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 of the German of physics. Uh, yeah, and uh, um, Norad was a sociologist. Hans Hahn were, was a um, was a mathematician. Frank was a physicist, etc. So they all had first-hand experience of science, and they knew how scientific knowledge claims were being established, and. They contrasted that with philosophical knowledge claims and what, what, what they called the chaos of system and the anarchy of even philosophical terminology. So um, philosophy rather came badly off by comparison. And it's not also not just that, that uh, science simply was sober and one knew what was talking, what one was talking about. Science also made absolutely revolutionary advances, and that's why... Einstein was of this 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 central uh, central importance. His general theory of or theory of general relativity, for instance, totally changed our ideas of space and time. Uh, roughly speaking, uh, space was no longer a fixed container through which time flowed, but there was a sort of a multidimensional space-time. And moreover, the structure of that was variable and was determined by the distribution of mass energy. You know, at 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 the specific location, etc. So, those were enormously revolutionary ideas, and they came out of science itself. And uh, did they get nothing at all? Sorry to interrupt you. Did they get nothing at all out of what we might loosely call the philosophical tradition? From what uh, Nancy was saying, it seems they they rejected it. Lock, stock, and barrel. Uh, well, they were, as, as Nancy said, they were kind of empiricists. So, in that sense, they uh, they felt a certain allegiance with, say, uh, David Hume, in a number of his sort of views. And they also, in their general approach, could be could be thought they they wanted to renew the Enlightenment movement, which they thought had had sort of run out of steam. And now, after, especially in those those dramatic days after the World War after World War One, they wanted to renew that there because every everything had to be built anew. And they thought, well, let's do it properly this time. Um, it, the phrase is how we know what we know. Was that the quest? That is that is how how Herbert Feigl, one of Schlick's mm. students, once 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 put it. He says there's there's a few basic questions which you always always uh, have to ask. What is it that you that you think you know? And secondly, how do you know it? And ask this each and every time. And if you do that, you won't be led by the nose, so to speak. Can we take the person they challenged most, who seemed to be the first mountain they looked back to, who was Kant, Immanuel Kant, and the, uh, an idea that was central to him, which was synthetic a priori. Now, can you explain that to our listeners and why this was so heavily challenged? Okay, now, the synthetic a priori was Kant's attempt to answer problems of previous empiricism. There were 
questions, for instance, uh, like everybody assumed that every event has a cause, but how do you prove that? You can't prove your your basis of experiences only of events you have so far experienced. You can't from that kind of generalize that into the future over all events. So one way out, which Kahn took, is to say, well, look, on the other hand, on the one hand, this supposition that every event is a cause underlies all our thinking. On the other hand, we can't prove it on the basis of experience. Well, we must get it from somewhere else. It must be, as it were, a, a truth of reason that we bring to our experience. Um, and But it was a truth of reason that said something about the world. So it was synthetic. It said something about the world. It had, had empirical content. But at the same time, it, it, it wasn't learned from experience. It came from within us, from reason. And in that sense, it was a priori. So that's the synthetic a priori. And what the what the uh, in in the course of the nineteenth century, sort of uh, continental philosophy, kind of invented all sorts of synthetic a priori for different different sciences. And some neo Kantians invented synthetic a priori for the social or historical sciences, etc. And again, uh, the theorists of the Vienna Circle sort of said, "What, what?" What control do we, what cognitive control do we have over the postulation of those things? And they kind of rejected this and said, look, let's just go back to how we know we can go, gain knowledge, namely, let's go back to the positive sciences. And there we have either empirical sources or we have logic. So we either have analytic truths or we have synthetic truths. The analytic truths are a priori, the synthetic truths are a posteriori, and therefore this third position that Kant outlined trying to bring the synthetic and the a priori together, we don't need it. Barry Smith, can we develop that using the word verification as a key? Yes, sure. Um, so, so exactly as Thomas said, you, you uh, have this tradition of empiricism where all of our knowledge is derived from the senses. But of course, um, some propositions like the propositions of mathematics don't seem to come through the senses. We don't seem to base them on evidence and testing and experience. So the empiricists were rather stuck as to how to explain them. The move forward to make this logical empiricism is the idea that uh, the truths of mathematics and logic are truths by definition, the truths in a system. So now you must ask of any statement, um, is it meaningful? And it's meaningful either because it can be verified. And now we have a criterion for meaningful empirical discourse, for meaningful factual talk. Can these statements And be by verified, they mean verified in, in a way which parallels that of scientific verification. Exactly. They mean by, we can verify a statement by observation or experiment. Basically, we must be able to tell what method would we go about using and and, and employing to find out whether this statement is true or false. Now, there were statements that could be verified. Everything else was either a tautology, a pure logical can you give a analytic statement, truth. Can you give us a couple of examples? Give us examples of a statement that can be verified. Please. It can be verified. And then the other one. Well, suppose you want to know whether the liquid in the, in the jar is an acid, then you can verify it by testing it with litmus paper and seeing whether the litmus paper turns red. If you want to know how many coins are in my pocket, you can verify it by turning out my pocket and counting them. But if you start to say that all reality is one substance or all reality uh, is a plurality of substances, we've no idea how we'd go about verifying that. That's, that's not verifiable. That's is it not? I mean, no, what about, I th what's all this particle research about then? Well, particle research is fine because you're using the methods of science, and the mm. methods of science have to be ultimately confirmed by the empirical basis. You've got to look at the, the meter readings, you've got to, to use the mathematics. But if you're making philosophical claims which are supposed to transcend methods of verification, then we don't even know what would make them true. So the verification uh, criterion of meaning becomes the kind of key tool to go about analysing which statements are acceptable and which are not. And of course, statements about ethics, religion and so on are not verifiable. They become meaningless. A way to tackle this now at this stage in the discussion would be to ask each of you, as it were, to take to take the place of one of the three key people. There's three of you here, and as you mentioned at the beginning of the programme, we have three main persons. I mean, that may be unfair to the others, but there's Schlick and there's Neurath and there's Carnap. So if you, uh, Thomas, can start saying what Schlick 
because we're not talking about a cohesive group there, the logical positivists, but, but we know what we're talking about, different people going towards the same end. Can you tell us what uh, Sch Moritz Schlick, what his main drive and argument was? Well, Schlick, as I uh, said earlier, sort of um, had, a, had a background in physics. He was uh, um, um, uh, one of the first philosophers in everywhere, really, to, to write knowledgeably and, uh, in fact, gaining Einstein's approval for that, about the theory of relativity, for special and, and, and then the general theory of relativity. And in Vienna, he turned to larger-scale epistemological question, questions about the theory of knowledge. And uh, amongst those three that you've just sort of mentioned, Schlick perhaps was still the most traditionalist. So within these, this kind of revolutionary movement, he was the one who was sort of most, most, most uh, betokened still to and the So how would you express that? And uh, one could say that in, uh, first of all, in how he himself thought of this new philosophy. He thought of that as specifically of, of um, trying to uh, make clear what we mean, a kind of meaning philosophy as meaning analysis, but it was still a distinctive subject, philosophy, whereas others like Neurath, basically he didn't even like the word philosophy because he was so abhorred by the past pretensions. And then very specifically, um, they disagreed about what the empirical basis of our scientific knowledge actually was. And there, all three of them made different proposals and they took different p p position in the course of a kind of a long debate that basically lasted the, the, the whole extent of, yeah. of the Vienna Circle. And, um, and, and Schlick believed ultimately that you could gain knowledge through observation, uh, which uh, could be... Uh, which which would be private was private observation. That's right. I mean, they all believed that observation was was yeah. the key to empirical knowledge. But he conceived of those of of the basic elements of our knowledge as statements about the content of our 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 uh, phenomenal experience. What is given to us? What appearances we have? Which precisely, as you as you suggested, were private. And there are certain difficulties attached to that, which. Which kind Nancy Cartwright? Sorry, I'm about to say about that. Nancy, what about uh, Nancy Cartwright? What about uh, Otto Neurath? Where did SUE stand? Is the wrong word. What was his drive? What was his contribution to this this group? Well, Neurath made two contributions. Um, I think uh, three. One was the political push, but the the philosophical contributions were in the first place. He strongly disagreed with Schlick about what were the what was the bottom line in science. He thought that um, this talk about our inner experiences was a dreadful mistake and that science always started with observations described in the language of physical objects. So it's not useful to say, I'm having an experience of a red thing. It might be useful to say the stoplight is red. One is a statement about my inner experience, and the other is a statement about a physical object in space and time. And it, it, it mattered because Neurath thought you could only build up science from these claims about physical objects and how they behaved in space and time. When you, Schlick, you keep using the word science, and, 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 and Thomas pointed out earlier that he rejected the, the whole notion of the idea of there being a philosophy. So philosophy didn't count anymore. It no. wasn't, in his, wasn't on his agenda. It wasn't on his agenda. It wasn't in his mind, as it were. Um, but nevertheless, he made two huge contributions sure. to the philosophy of logical positivism. And the reason Schlick wanted to go back to experience was the nice thing about science is that it gives us a high degree of certainty. And if you begin to look for certainty, there's a natural progression to think, well, I could actually readily be mistaken about whether the stoplight was red. Uh, perhaps I missaw it, perhaps the light was reflected in non-standard circumstances, etc. Um, but you, you pull back and say, well, if I want some certain foundations for science, um, let's go back to something I can really be sure of. Re I have this red experience now. So it was the it, it, one of the reasons for wanting to pull back into subjective experience as the basis for science was to try to find some basis that was certain. And Neuert thought that was absolutely mad, that you could never build uh, science from those kinds of propositions. So you, you can't build quantum field theory from reports of red here now, 
which was the kind of experiential report. And uh, Barry, Barry Smith, Rudolf Carnap. Yes, Carnap comes in as the mediator between these two other figures. So Symbolically, got, you're sitting between these and two I am. I, I feel like the mediator I just now. I informed the listener of how carefully this programme has been organised. It's been very well constructed. So, so we have um, this insistence that science is ultimately based on the private experiences and observations of the individual scientist. We've got Neurath talking about the public... Uh, language describing uh, physical objects and their properties. One of the things I neglected to mention was that for Neurot, what was very, very important is something that we now stress uh, about science is that it's a public enterprise and the vision of labor mm. and that you really did need to have all these different activities by all these different uh, scientists doing different jobs. Th th and that's that, true, that but that drove you to a uh, physicalist language, yeah, that, a shared that, physicalist language. That's true, but of course Carnap doesn't quite readily give up the idea that philosophy has a role. So he thinks the role it has is, in fact, to be a logic for describing uh, theories and systems. And logic is supposed to give you rigour, clarity, sharp definition of concepts. This is a fantastically good tool to, to saying, what precisely is my theory claiming? How is it related to its observational or evidential base? Now, Carnap, at this point, has a sort of conventional move to reconcile the other two. He says, we could build a theory that's uh, ultimately talking about as the evidence-based experiences and the, the individual reports, but we could just as easily have a theory that talks about physical objects and makes that the basis and the evidential support for the theory. And it's a conventional choice which one of these you use. If they can both deliver predictions and results, both will do. So we now introduce this idea that you've got uh, competing theories. And another important point of, of this, he calls it a principle of tolerance. He says, you know, you can build up your theory any way you like from the inside, and then you can ask questions about what follows in the theory. What is the theory claiming? If you stand back and you ask, but which of these theories is right or correct? Now you're asking something quite meaningless. There are only questions internal to the theory, not questions, meaningful questions, external to the theory. Thomas, well, the Ludwig uh, Wittgenstein visited the Vienna Circle uh, in the 1920s. Uh, what did what did they take from him? Well, um, they took from Wittgenstein, who in 22, 21, 22, published a famous book, the Tractatus Logico Philosophicus. It's probably one of the most uh, austere philosophy books ever published and they stumbled across that and in fact read it in the group in, in meetings throughout a whole sort of academic year in 1925 and they found in that the key for the problem that made their positivism distinctive as, as it's also sometimes called made it into logical empiricism namely they found there the key for solving the problem for how to how to account for our knowledge of logic and mathematics Prior to Wittgenstein, still with Russell, um, logic was thought of as describing, as it were, the most abstract laws for the furniture of the universe altogether. What Wittgenstein introduced was the, the idea that logic itself was empty, tautologous. And the word empty here means it doesn't tell us anything about the world. Logic tells us, for example, either it's raining or it's not raining. That That is logically true. It exhausts the possibilities, but it doesn't tell us anything about what the world is like. And or, and, and that was that was the job of logic. Logic was a, a calculus to allow us to build statements that had formation rules and then it had transformation rules. It showed which statements followed from others and which contradicted each other. And therefore, our knowledge of knowledge, so to speak, could was trained or could in some sense be considered uh, knowledge of truths of reason, but these truths of reason were precisely, again, not empir empirical. They were not truths about the world. And with this knowledge, with this account of logic, they were able to say, well, look, we are good empiricists. We don't, we don't need to account for rational intuition to learn about numbers, etc., because they also believed, as Wittgenstein didn't, but they added that to Wittgenstein's idea of the tautologiousness of logic, that all of mathematics could be reduced to knowledge, uh, to logic. That was a program of logicism they inherited from, from Frege and Russell. Uh, Barry Smith, can we turn to the uh, uh, area of language now? Um, uh, 
the philo their philosophy became it became a critique of language and logic and and uh, not reality. Can you unravel that, please? They they believe that um, there is a job for a philosophy to do, but it's the job of logical analysis. And logical analysis um, means that uh, what philosophy amounts to, Carnap thought, was the logic of science. This was this was the only job left for philosophy. So you look at science uh, as a set of claims, a set of statements, trying to make hypotheses about the way the world works, claims about what we observe. And you have to make those claims rigorous, logically well structured. You have to show how certain observational statements are predicted or follow from theoretical statements. You have to show how you how internally consistent your theory is. So you're using um, a study of the meanings of words and the meanings of uh, theoretical scientific language to be the only philosophy that's left. It's logical analysis. Now this of course means that in areas like um, ethics, um, we're going to claim that ethical statements, that it's wrong to steal money or it's good to be kind to one's neighbour, these are not empirically provable statements, nor are they logical tautologies. So they end up being meaningless. But now what we can do is we can say, well, let's analyse the language of ethics. Let's do a linguistic analysis and say, what does this ethical talk mean? And they come up with a new view. In fact, Freddie Ayer, E.J. Ayer, comes up with a new view that we shouldn't see ethical words as describing the world. We should see them as expressing our feelings. They're a way of indicating our attitudes and inclinations, our emotions, if you so like. So stealing is wrong is not, a, is, not a, is not a fact, it's an opinion. It's an opinion, and it's an opinion I try to convince you of and A.J. Ayer, who had this emotivist theory of um, ethical statements developed eventually by Stevenson, says we could just as well say, you stole that in a sharp tone of voice, or we could raise our eyebrows. So when we say it's wrong, we're saying, I disapprove. And in or, fact... Or you're just saying that it's, it's often called the boo-hurrah theory. So you're boo -hurrah. saying, yeah. you stole something. Boo! boo. Your you kind, kind. Kindness, your kind. Hurrah! So this is the parody of the view, mainly that uh, when you utter it's wrong or it's right, you're just giving a thumbs up or a thumbs down to what actually happened. Can we uh, just push this a bit further, uh, Nancy? Um, can you give us an example of the sort of process a logical positivist, there were, there's no pure log. We know they're different people. You yeah, three yeah. of you have expressed different views on, 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 of the different people. Never mind. What would he go through to, to get, let's call it, a secure starting point? I mean, the secure starting point for a theologian would be a belief in God, that there is a God. That's a secure starting point. Uh, Aquinas would have, Augustine would have. That's where I start from. And and similarly through other other. other well, you, you probably wouldn't call them disciplines, but <laughs> areas of knowledge. What's a secure starting point for a logical positivist? Well, I'm sorry, but there are three positions. <laughs> a secure starting point for Schlick would be a report of your own experience. That can't go wrong. Um, maybe you can't get very far starting with that secure starting point, but you know, how could you be mistaken that you are having a red experience now. Well, you've just proved, you just said earlier you could be mistaken. Well, that's Neurot's view and it's my view, yeah. but it wasn't Schlick's view. Oh, so Schlick yeah. uh, has the view that once you've retreated into subjective experience, it's secure. Um, the um, Neurot's view was that nothing is secure, that you have observation reports and um, you have to use the language and the concepts that you have at the moment and you have to use the methods that you have at the moment and you have to make your bet about what are the best methods and what are the things that you are most secure in and he used this metaphor of we're like sailors having to rebuild our ships at sea and never able to put into dry dock and build from a firm foundation so Neuwald thought you do have to have um, test uh, your claims and make them consistent with your observations, but you're never secure that your observations are right, and even your observations might have been wrong, and you've got to start rebuilding. So um, Neurot said no secure starting points, and as I understand Carnap, Carnap said, well, you can choose a set of claims that you're going to hold constant for the moment and look to see what that body of theory is surrounding those, but the choice, it's more like the Neurot view, the choice there is going to be conventional. 
Thomas Schubert, were, were traditional philosophers fighting back at this point, or did the logical positive just sweep away all of the systems? They, uh, did people say, we've just, something revolutionary has happened, we must uh, abandon all traditional ways of thinking and, and join in? No, uh, they did. They did sort of fight back, um, depending depending on what place and what uh, what what time we're sort of talking about. Um, in Austria and Germany, for related sort of movements like the Berlin Society for Empirical Philosophy, they fought back by simply um, ejecting them, saying, sending them into exile if they were lucky. Um, because political developments were such that, uh, you know, under Nazism, that kind of science evidence-based reasoning was just utterly opposed uh, by the by the authorities because it contradicted what they were uh, sort of claiming. So the, the Viennese circle was... Was, uh, was dispersed, dispersed. And Moritz it was partly, Schlick, of course, the, the fact that a great number of them were Jews hastened exactly. the dispersal, yes. But exactly. it was connected with what they thought as well. well yes. And they were socialists. Yes. They weren't just Jews, they were... Jews and socialists. And, and remember, they're sweeping away large tracts of German philosophy, which were yes. very important to yes, the Nazi those three ideology. Yes, yes. So, other, uh, so th- uh, that's what happened there. But what about France, for instance? With the, the, uh, we're, are they are they saying we're not having anything to do with um, this? Well, France, there was for a while a sort of an uh, opening for them. They had uh, a very big international con- uh, conference there in, in 1935, Unity of Science Conference. But it's the recent research suggests that, in fact, Neurath, who was always the one who, who initiated these contacts, uh, was talking to the wrong people and they fell between the cracks of sort of internecine Parisian intellectual warfare. So they didn't get too far there. But in, in England, of course, they had a spokesman in A.J. Eyre who somewhat simplified their sort of doctrines, but certainly put it out. And Eyre... Being, you know, promoting the doctrine with his youthful sort of en- enthusiasm, obviously took great fight into taking on all comers, and uh, so then and it helped establish an Oxford group, didn't it? Language, truth, and logic was a uh, when uh, it was resonated it grew, around it, the. It yes. grew out of a air went for four months to Vienna in thirty two thirty three. He came back and began to gather a group of discussants in Isaiah Berlin's rooms in All Souls. There was a core group of seven, a bit like the Vienna Circle, a core group of seven that met weekly and discussed the ideas of essentially logical positivism, among other things. And as in Vienna, they all were progressive, left-wing, they tended to be anti-appeasement and were... uh, almost all of them involved in the labor government and a kind of socialist-leaning um, activities after the war. And to push on a bit, uh, um, we, 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 it went to America too as well, didn't it, Barry? Yes, it did. I, I mean, mean, when this dispersal, <coughs> they literally went to America for yes. refuge. Yeah. Some of them went to the UK, some of them went to America. But that, and again, that, had a big impact that had on a America. Huge, that had a huge impact. Mm. You, have, um, you have the view that becomes very prominent, I think, at that time in the U.S., that philosophy of science is philosophy enough, that if you're doing philosophy of science, you're doing something that's making a real contribution, that other things should really fall away. You've got the development of logic, which Carnap continues to develop, but you've also got young philosophers of science coming through, people like Quine, who set up a a generation of new philosophers of science and create new problems, taking the ideas forward, disagreeing with what came before. But it's, it's this that actually shapes what we call the Anglo-American tradition and especially the analytic tradition in philosophy. You mentioned Quine. He, is it, it's probably simplistic, I'm awfully sorry about this, but he, as it were, attacked logical positivism, didn't he? He did, but I think you can't understand Quine unless you see that his attack is a way of cleaning the stable so that empiricism can go on. He thought they were mistaken. He thought they were committed to dogmas. He thought one of the dogmas was that every statement was either analytic and synthetic and he thinks, actually, this division between you know, facts about the world and facts about meaning is not very robust. In fact, they bleed into each other. There's no clear distinction. And the other thing he rejects is the idea that we can ground our theoretical statements on observations and experience. He says that our statements must face the tribunal of experience as a corporate body, as a whole. Briefly, I'm off, I mean, there's a lot more to say, and um, I just tip of iceberg stuff. But still, can you briefly tell me what influence you think this has had on thought as generally 
in uh, since the 1920s and 30s, Thomas Hugel? Well, I think uh, um, while it is not a sort of a live project in analytical philosophy now, it very much has set up its ideals of clarity uh, and um, making testable, justifiable, at least knowledge claims, and to um, render philosophy in some sense scientific. I mean, at the moment, I think we see in analytic philosophy still a strong sort of counter-reaction to it. So 30 years ago, somebody said, well, logical positivism is about as dead a philosophical movement as it ever will be. But in a certain sense, it's sort of it, it's they're, they're sort of the living dead. On the one hand, they're, they're still being invoked by contemporary philosophers whenever they want to put forward their current theories as something which they, 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 they reject and want to do better with. And on the other hand, much recent research in the history of analytic philosophy has shown that indeed what, what this program will have brought out, that the logical positivists were not as homogeneous as they often portrayed, but actually give you this wide variety of positions, some of which anticipate its later overcoming. Nancy Cartwright. I think that they were also part of a movement. I don't know whether they... It's not, I don't want to say they were the coals of it, but they were the spokespeople for a movement to scientize the study of society so that the idea that you were scientizing philosophy was only a part of it. They were scientizing uh, the study of society, and they were... Uh, cons they moved along with uh, the idea that you could construct a better society by evidence-based policy, which is all the rage at the moment. And finally, and briefly, I'm sorry, Barry, Barry Smith. Yes, I think they've changed the idea that philosophy has its own subject matter. Instead, philosophy is a second-order discipline. It's the philosophy of science, of mathematics, of biology, and so on. So we're making a contribution, as it were, to the methodology. We don't do work on our own to create new doctrines. Well, thank you very much indeed for bringing that down to us. I was a bit, to put it mildly, worried about this programme. Uh, thank you very much, Nancy Cartwright, Barry Smith and Thomas. We will next, uh, next week we'll be talking about the Eid Ikara, the uh, Precambrian life forms which vanished 542 million years ago, were they the earliest form of life. Thank you for listening. If you've enjoyed this Radio 4 podcast, why not try others, such as Thinking Aloud, where Laurie Taylor discusses the latest social science research. To find out more, visit bbc.co.uk forward slash Radio 4.